fitness goal, uh, maybe completing a course of study. Uh, and once we complete that great project, whatever it is, another question arises, doesn't it? Uh, the question of, well, what are we going to do next? <laughs> what happens next? I remember when I finished my university degree at the graduation ceremony, one of my lecturers came up to me and said, well, congratulations, Martin, but what are you going to do now? And I remember thinking at the time, that's a really good question. I didn't really have much of an idea of what I was going to do after university. But it's the kind of question we're familiar with once we've achieved one great project. We think, well, what's the next thing we're going to go on to? Um, it's been said that the Gospel of Mark is a gospel of two halves. Or perhaps we could say it's a gospel of two projects. The first project is Mark asking the question, well, who is Jesus? And as we've discovered over the sermons we've had during term two of, of this year, um, Mark has worked hard to provide an answer to that question of, of who is Jesus. Jesus is the one who, is who has power over nature. Jesus is the one who has power over evil. Jesus is the true leader of his people. And of course, this question of identity comes to its climax in chapter 8, verse 29, when Peter confesses to Jesus, you are the Messiah. That's the answer to this question that Mark has been asking, who is Jesus? And so last time we were in Mark's gospel, we came to the end of that first great project, the question, who is Jesus? But now we've come to the end of that project, there's another question. Well, what happens next? And so Mark begins on his second great project in this gospel, which is where he asks the question, well, what does it mean to follow Jesus? We've discovered who Jesus is, but now the question is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And so this term, term three, we'll be asking the question, well, what does it mean, once we've understood who Jesus is, what does it mean to become his disciple? What does it mean to become a follower? And the passage we're looking at today is kind of like a bit of an executive summary with, with regard to, to an answer to, to that particular question. But it is a goal that is going to stretch us, or it's a project, rather, that's going to stretch us. Just like someone might complete a 10-kilometre fun run and then decide to go on to a bigger project, completing maybe a 42-kilometre marathon, um, so too, it seems to me, this second project of asking the question, what does it mean to follow Jesus? This is going to be something that stretches us. Will all the work be worth it? Yes, of course it'll be worth it. Because as we'll discover in today's passage, there is a great personal cost if we don't invest ourselves in this second project. If we don't seriously consider the question, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And so Mark allows Jesus to introduce this second great theme in chapter 8, verse 34. But before we hear from Jesus, let's just take a note of the audience who is hearing Jesus at this point in time. Mark makes the observation how Jesus called the crowd to him along with the disciples. What Jesus is about to say here is not just a message for the spiritual elite, not just a message for the disciples. Rather, it's also a message for the crowd, the people who have gathered around, maybe the people who are just hanging out at the back, observing what is going on. You might think of yourself as the least of all Christians. You might think of yourself as barely attached to the back of the crowd who are surrounding Jesus. But know this, this is a message for you as well as for the people in the front row. A message for all of us. And what is the message? Well, uh, this is how Jesus describes this second great project. Uh, once we've discovered who he is, this is what comes next. Uh, from the second part of verse 34. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. As Jesus lays out this project before us, we discover there are actually three commands in a row here. Deny yourself take up your cross and follow me. Let's take them one by one, just briefly. Uh, deny yourself. Well, that sounds intense, doesn't it? Uh, and perhaps it 
is a drastic thing to do, depending on how much we have invested in ourselves, how much we admire about ourselves. Uh, maybe it might be a very drastic thing to do. What Jesus is calling for us here is to develop a, a very serious sense of humility. What he's calling for us is a Copernican revolution in our self-understanding. Now, what do I mean by a Copernican revolution? Well, Nicholas Copernicus, if you remember your lessons from high school science, Nicholas Copernicus was an astronomer from the 16th century. And he made the radical suggestion that it was not the Earth that was at the centre of the universe, but rather it was the Sun at the centre of the solar system. And instead of the Sun in or being in orbit around the Earth, rather it was the Earth in orbit around the Sun. A, a Copernican revolution. Now, this was uncomfortable news for many people. Uh, it took some getting used to, to thinking about the universe in this way. But when Nicholas Copernicus studied the heavens, this is what he was able to observe. Now, what Jesus is asking from us is that we recognise that we are not at the centre. Back in the 16th century, it's understandable why people thought the Earth was at the centre of all things, because it's the most important planet that we know of. Uh, why wouldn't we be at the centre? And we can think the same thing about ourselves, can't we? But Jesus is asking for us to, to bring into focus a, a revolution in thinking. We are not at the centre. We remove ourselves from the centre, from the middle, and we allow someone else to be at the centre. Who that person is, well, I think you can probably guess, but we'll get to that in just a second. But the first thing to know is that denying yourself calls for this kind of revolution in thinking. We're no longer in the middle. And as we move away from the centre, secondly, Jesus asks us to accept some degree of discomfort and sacrifice. Take up your cross he commands us. In the paragraphs before today's reading, Jesus has been explaining to his disciples how his ministry will culminate in a great act of suffering, a great sacrifice, going to the cross and then, of course, uh, being raised from the dead in a, in a glorious uh, resurrection. But now he is commanding his followers to be ready to walk the same path. For Mark's original hearers, this carried with it the possibility of martyrdom, to face death just as Christ faced death. And it means this for many Christians in the modern era as well. Up until this point in our own society, the suffering caused by following Jesus has been relatively minimal, but times are changing. Now who knows what subsequent generations of Christians will have to face? Are we willing to teach them by word and example, what it means to take up your cross, to deny yourself, to follow Jesus. Even as things stand in the moment, we know that there are plenty of opportunities to shelve the cross rather than take up the cross. An opportunity to give a word of witness, a loyal word of witness to Jesus, uh, but we remain silent an opportunity to do a good work, but yet that opportunity we let pass by. An opportunity to provide a, a God-honouring sacrifice, and yet that sacrifice is withheld, kept to ourselves. All examples of shelving the cross rather than picking up the cross and carrying the cross. A couple of weeks ago, we purchased a cubby house through the Gumtree website, and the deal was that we would arrive at the household in St Ives and we would dismantle the cubby ourselves and carry it back to our own house. And so we hired a tradesperson from the Airtasker website to do this job for us. But one hour into the job, we get a phone call from the owners of the cubby house, the sellers of the cubby house, informing us that the tradesperson had left the job and the cubby house was now half disassembled, lying on their lawn became apparent that the task of carrying this structure back to our place was too much for this tradesperson, so they decided to have a much easier Saturday morning. Friends, let's not drop that 
which Christ has asked us to carry. The temptation will be to make things easier for ourselves, but that is not the way of the cross. The final command in this three-part instruction is to follow Jesus. If we've moved ourselves out from the centre then the sun that we are now in orbit around, as you've probably guessed earlier on, is Jesus himself. Jesus becomes our guide. Jesus becomes our model. Jesus becomes our Lord. Just think for a moment how vital the S-U-N sun, how vital that sun is to life on this planet, how, how it, it drives the water cycle, how it drives the seasons, how it drives the, the growth of, of plants which provide our oxygen. And in the same way, if the S-O-N sun, if that sun is going to be at the centre of our personal lives, then it's only appropriate that he be the one who drives everything that we, that we plan and everything that we do. It really is a revolution to have Jesus at the centre. Instead of asking, well, what items should I include in our household budget? We ask instead, well, what kinds of things does Jesus want me to include in our household budget? Instead of asking the question, well, where is it that I'd like to live? We first of all ask the question, well, where is it that Jesus would have me live? And remember, friends, this is not just a question for our missionaries. Jesus is speaking to the crowd. It's a question for for all Christians. Instead of asking the question, well, who is it that I'd like to marry? We first of all ask the question, well, Does Jesus want me to marry this person? We ask the question, well, where is it that Jesus would like me to spend my time? What places would Jesus like me to spend time in? Uh, What kind of content does Jesus want me to consume when I open up my internet browser? It changes the questions we ask our children and grandchildren. We've all asked a young person, well, what is it that you want to do when you grow up? But have we ever asked, well, what is it that you think Jesus would have you do when you grow up? Now, it might make us feel a little bit uncomfortable to ask those kinds of questions, but why should it be uncomfortable if Jesus is at the centre? If we do feel a little bit awkward asking these questions, then perhaps it's evidence that in actual fact, we've been pushing Jesus out to the edges. Then when, it comes, when it comes to thinking about our life's journey, he's actually become a bit of a stranger, or at very best, perhaps an occasional visitor. But friends, he asks to be much more than that. He asks to be at the centre. Will we recognise his rightful position, guiding all that we plan, guiding all that we do? It's a very quick series of commands that Jesus gives us here in verse 34, but I, I, I think to obey them may take some thinking. It may take some planning. Um, Part of the problem in thinking through this command, particularly to deny yourself, is that we still exist within ourselves. And so we we can never leave ourselves behind in an absolute sense. Uh, We could be tempted to think that deny yourself means neglect yourself or abuse yourself or hate yourself. Uh, But the thing is, if we take deny yourself to mean those things, then I think we actually become less able to be followers of Jesus. There's a great story about a 19th century Scottish Presbyterian minister named Robert Murray McShane. He died at the age of 29 and he was renowned for his hard work ethic and perhaps it could be true that he pushed it too hard because on his deathbed it is reported that he had these words to say. The Lord gave me a horse to ride and a message to deliver. Alas, I have killed the horse and cannot deliver the message. The horse being, of course, uh, his own body, which he had worn out and which was now breaking down. So it's true, friends, that we ought to identify the things in this world that we say no to, things we deny ourselves, but we need to think carefully about what, what it's wise to say yes to. Um, And to navigate our way way forward, we'll need to invest some time in personal reflection. We'll need to invest some time in prayer, some time in studying the scriptures, and also some time in discussion with others. 
But friends, it's time we must invest in. Because as we'll see in the following verses, uh, if we don't take these commands serious, seriously, there's the, the very real potential for some, some serious personal loss. Um, the danger of ignoring these commands is spelled out from verse 35, where Jesus says this, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. We live in a culture where we lead ourselves to believe that we can find success on every front. I remember when I was at school, uh, the successful students uh, would often compete with one another to have as many honours as they could fit printed on their blazer. If you were successful in a certain field of endeavour, uh, you could get a little line printed on your blazer, uh, academic success, uh, co-curricular success, representative sport. Uh, the great students were those who were able to find success on every front. Now, does that logic translate into our walk with Jesus? Can we find success walking with Jesus as well as success harbouring our own personal ambitions? Can we be winners on both fronts? Some people might like to think they can set up two thrones at the centre, one for Jesus and one for themselves. Well, Jesus is clear. If you make plans to save the life that you are designing for yourself, then that life will be taken from you. You could become very successful at life in this world. You might be really good at setting goals and achieving them. Uh, but Jesus says it's not worth it. Verse 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? The American preacher John Piper has a striking illustration of the foolishness on focusing on this life's goals rather than eternal goals, rather than the goals that Jesus would have us focus on. Uh, he tells the story of a couple in their 50s who retired early to the state of Florida and who spent their days cruising on their boat, playing softball and collecting shells. And then Piper says this, At first, when I read it, I thought it might be a joke, a spoof on the American dream, but it wasn't. Tragically, this was the dream. Come to the end of your life, your one and only precious God-given life, and let the last great work of your life before you give an account to your creator be this, playing softball and collecting shells. Picture them before Christ on the great day of judgment. Look, Lord, look at my shells. That is a tragedy. Piper writes, and people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. None of our self-centred ambitions, no matter how successful we are in, in achieving them, will matter on that last day. Uh, it's not like how the ancient Egyptians imagined it. You've probably seen pictures of their tombs stuffed full of worldly goods in order to smooth their transition into the ever after. Uh, it won't be like that at all. Jesus asks in verse 37, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? No matter what you achieve in this world, you won't be able to use it to buy your life back once it's taken from you. All of this will become strikingly and irreversibly clear on the day Jesus returns. Uh, verse 38, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. That's often the dark side to the goals that we set ourselves, isn't it? Uh, we, we want a life that we can be proud of, that others can be proud of, that others might be envious of, that others will be impressed by. And life with Jesus is just a little bit too embarrassing. It's just a little bit too mundane, a little bit too unimpressive. And we become ashamed of that life. And so we pursue other things. But on that last day, we won't be worried about what other people are thinking because there'll only be one person's opinion that counts, the opinion of Jesus. And here he warns us, on that day, there will be some of whom he is ashamed. 
But friends, it need not be that way. It need not be that way. Just have a look back with me at the, the second half of verse 35. Whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. You can seek to save your own life, but lose it in the end. But if you lose your life now, you will save it in the end. Instead of Jesus being ashamed of you, you can secure Christ's pride in you. And you do this by denying yourself and placing Jesus at the centre. Now, those who are familiar with the Christian message might feel at this point that this focuses a little bit too much on our ability to do the right thing, our ability to deny ourselves and place Jesus at the centre. Is it not the case, you might ask, that eternal life is secured by what Jesus has done on our behalf, wiping our sins away by his blood so that God finds no fault in us? Well, yes, eternal life is the gift of God based on what was achieved through Christ's blood. But know this, Christ's blood not only forgives, it also purchases We read in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. With your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language and people and nation. If we want the forgiveness of sins afforded by the blood of Jesus, then we ought to know that that blood of Jesus purchases us for God. We belong now to him. Forgiveness of sins, yes, but submission to Christ's lordship also. This is why he has the right to be at the centre, because he has purchased us, along with the fact that he is the Messiah, the the very point that Mark has been making in his gospel all along. And our reading ends, chapter 9, verse 1, and this verse serves as a final encouragement for us to place Christ at the centre. Jesus is speaking a little bit mysteriously here when he says, truly I tell you, Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. This seems to be a a reference to the resurrection of Jesus, that point in history where Jesus once and for all was established as the one true power in the universe, the one true Lord in the universe. Because of his resurrection, it, it feels like a pretty safe bet to have him at the centre of your life. Uh, Because he is the winner. He is the Lord. He is the resurrected King. If you want to find yourself on the right side of history, that's a phrase that's become popular in the last few years, if you want to find yourself on the right side of history, then the way to do it is to have Jesus at the centre because he is the resurrected Lord for all eternity. Now, we've been told recently that we need to expect to live life with a new normal. You heard that phrase? Uh, Because of the coronavirus and the changes that it's brought about, uh, the old normal is gone and the new normal is here. But friends, for Christian people, uh, we've been living in a new normal, or we ought to have been living in a new normal for quite some time. Because the new normal is that we remove ourselves from the centre and we allow Christ to take that position. Have you embraced this new normal or are you still living with the old normal? The old normal is a dangerous place to be. Jesus warns us here. He is the one who needs to be at the centre. So friends, put him in the centre and don't wait for that time when Jesus himself will have to take the initiative. You don't want to take that long. Embrace the new normal. Live with the new normal. I'll I'll now lead us in a prayer of repentance. Will you join with me? I'll pray. Father, we hear these words of Jesus and we are chastened. We accept all the evidence about who Jesus is, but perhaps we have not yet budged from being in the middle of our own world. We are sorry for this self-centeredness. We seek the forgiveness made possible by Jesus' death and we ask you to help us to move aside and allow Jesus to rule. Help each of us discover what this means for us. Help us see with clarity the things that we are to reject. Help us embrace the new things that Jesus would have us do, the new ways that he would have us think. In his name we pray. Amen.